Hello, good evening and welcome to Planning Shorts. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us this evening for the pilot episode in this Cross Chambers Planning webinar series. My name is Killian Garvey. I'm a specialist planning barrister at King's Chambers and I will be hosting tonight's episode. This series is called Planning Shorts. So as you might have guessed, uh, I'm certainly appropriately dressed for the occasion. Um, before I introduce our other panelists, let me begin by pointing out at the bottom of your screen, you should hopefully see a chat function, which allows you to type questions. So if during the webinar, some of you have questions relevant to what we're talking about, please do not hes hesitate to ask questions and we'll hopefully have some time at the end to deal with them. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Thea, if you'd like to go first. Hello and good evening, everyone, all 250 three of you. Um, very good to see you. I'm Thea Osmond smith and I'm a barrister specialising in planning and environmental law at Number 5 Chambers, uh, quickly approaching uh, year 10 um, at the planning bar, believe it or not. Killian, this evening I also have shorts on, uh, but they are just very boring blue shorts, rather like my drink. Now I don't know if you've heard a horrible rumour, but there are members of the planning bar who have been giving webinars while drinking alcohol, which is of course something I would never do. Cheers. Well, we certainly don't endorse any of that scandalous behaviour. Um, so Matthew, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Fraser. I'm a barrister at Landmark Chambers, also specialising in um, planning and environmental law. Um, I am also wearing shorts, as you can see from they're sort of short, maybe a bit too short beige um, coloured. Um, I am drinking a cup of lemon and ginger herbal tea in a mug which has all of the kings and queens of England on it, which, which is news to me. Cheers, everyone. Yes. So Matthew does his own stunts there. Um, Victoria, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Killian. Hi, I'm Victoria Hutton, often known as Tora. Uh, I'm a planning and environmental law barrister at 39 Essex Chambers. I'm just coming back actually off of maternity leave where I've been since January uh, and I for one am very glad that things are very much as I left them. Um, it's not like we've had a global event which has changed uh, decision making, uh, appeals, hearings and, uh, and indeed court hearings. So, um, oh wait. Um, I am not wearing shorts, I'm afraid, and I am drinking Appletizer, which um, I'm sure a psychologist would have a field day, but for some reason sparks joy. <laughs> and finally, Ashley, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ashley Bowes. I'm a barrister specialising in planning environment law at Cornerstone Barristers. Um, sadly, I'm neither wearing shorts nor drinking alcohol, as I've been in a planning inquiry all day, although perhaps a planning inquiry will be enhanced by both alcohol and shorts, um, but I thought best not to do that on the first occasion. Right, well everyone, the title of today's episode is Is the Planning System Rigged? We're going to be talking about bias in the planning system, which is topical given the Secretary of State's recent decision in the Westbury case that we're going to get into. But before we get into that, um, we should address the fact that Ashley, as you've just mentioned, you've been doing uh, one of the first virtual inquiries today. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience of uh, embracing the new age of inquiries? I'll be delighted. Um, Francis Morney, the inspector, told us yesterday that this is the first inquiry to proceed on a virtual platform. So we were joined, a bit like the um, lovely 295 people reviewing us at the moment, by a whole host of PINs people. So that made it doubly um, uh, embarrassing and difficult. Um, but basically, I mean, it's a fairly standard planning inquiry. It concerns 150 houses on the outside of a village called Rain in Essex. We've got 11 witnesses, two parish councils taking an active role. And um, beside a few tweaks, it's proceeding in a very similar way to a normal inquiry. So we sit on both Mondays of two uh, programme weeks and the days comprise three 90 minutes chunks of evidence broken up by frequent adjournments. Um, it, I mean, the good news is it works so you can get through the material. Um, the bad news is that there are perhaps inevitably technological breakdowns. And we had a, a lovely session this afternoon where the inspector could hear and see everything that we were saying and the witnesses were saying we couldn't hear her. So a lot of the material was directed through sort of an inspector semaphore, probably I would best describe it, you know, sort of up and down and left and right. So that was all very entertaining. But um, I, I would say estimate a, a good additional third extra time 
to get through the material to allow for people dropping out and witnesses not being heard and things having to be repeated. Um, but, you know, hats off to PINs for really getting this going because, it, frankly, it's better than nothing. And um, so long as we can't meet together in a room, um, I think it, it, it's a good stopgap and it will enable decisions to be taken and the system to keep turning. Can you see it being something which potentially has long term as a long term possibility even after the pandemic's mm -hmm. finished? I think it does, um, but perhaps not for the, the complicated multi party inquiries where there's lots of evidence and looking at multiple documents at the same time. Uh, I think there's a really good role for. Uh, written reps appeals which have where an issue about where oral representation is necessary arises uh, and at the uh, and the current system you'd have to have a hearing convened for that I think that's a really good proportionate way of dealing with it is just to have a quick um, Microsoft Teams uh, hour or half an hour session uh, similarly with with some simple hearings they could be conducted I think with the inspector leading the conversation and, and structuring participation all the way through um, so I think there's a, a role to play um, and um, hopefully it will continue to have that role and this has been a useful learning exercise to to achieve it. All right well thank you Ashley I suspect we could probably spend a whole webinar on that but we're going to be talking today about is the planning system rigged and before we give you our take on that question what we thought would be interesting to do is to take your uh, view on it everyone who's viewing from home so hopefully and um, this is testing my uh, my aptitude but hopefully you should all be seeing a poll right now asking you all the question, is the planning system rigged? I should say that uh, your answers are entirely anonymous. Neither we nor any of the other viewers will be able to see what you've put. But we just thought it would be interesting if people were able to give their view on whether the planning system is uh, rigged. And I should say we've got a broad range of viewers. We've got some barristers, we've got private planning consultants, officers from local planning authorities, and even some planning inspectors, I believe. Right. So Are you uh, getting the results, Killian? I'm seeing I'm seeing a live version of the results now. Oh, wow. That 70% of you have voted, and I will share the results in a moment um, with, with everyone. I've got to end the poll in order to do that. So uh, I'll I'll give everyone just a couple of seconds more to be able to cast their final ballots. I, I think there's a few people who are undecided on this, <laughs> which, which might, might suggest that uh, might suggest an answer to the question. Okay, right, well, I'll end, I'll end the poll now uh, and I'll share the results so everyone can hopefully see that. And you can hopefully see okay. um, that the 47% of people said that the planning system is a little bit rigged. 30% uh, said mostly not, 12% said absolutely, 4% <laughs> said not at all, and 8% said can't decide. Right, well, what, what, what we'll do is we'll return to that poll uh, at the end and see if we've uh, changed anyone's minds. So let's jump in with what makes this a, a topical subject. Thea, uh, the recent Westbury case, are you able to give us an outline of what this was about? Yes, I am, but I'm assuming that most people uh, who are attending this webinar will know something about the case, uh, unless they've been living uh, under a rock or perhaps in their garden enjoying the nice weather uh, during lockdown. But this was a scheme for over 1,500 residential units shops, offices, restaurants, pubs, so a great big fat juicy scheme on the former Westfree print work site in Tower Hamlets. Now the application was recovered in April 2019 and, in April, uh, and an inquiry was heard uh, in September of last year. Now the inspector David Prentice recommended refusal in his report dated the 20th of November, mainly because there was already a consented fallback scheme for 722 homes. And the appeal scheme really wasn't considered to be that much more beneficial, but was considered by the inspector to be significantly more harmful than the fallback option. The Secretary of State disagreed uh, and allowed the appeal on the 14th of January 2020. Now, that was a super important date because the very next day, the council adopted its local plan, which included the new SIL charging schedule, which was to take effect a couple of days later on the 17th of January. And the date of that had been public for some time. So that's when things got really interesting because the timing of the decision meant that the developer uh, avoided a sill liability of around £40 million. So the council entered into pre-action correspondence with the government legal department on behalf of the Secretary of State and sought disclosure of all relevant documents to do with the appeal. It was a pretty chunky disclosure request. 
Now, there was no disclosure, uh, but the correspondence said that the Secretary of State had received advice on the new SIL charging schedule, and the timing of the decision was at least partly to do with concerns that delay could impact on the viability of the proposed development. So the council then brought its challenge on one issue, and that was whether there is a real possibility that the Secretary of State failed to act independently and impartially when determining the appeal by being biased in favour of the appellant developer. And of course, as we know, the Secretary of State conceded on the basis of apparent bias. Well, thanks, Thea. Um, so, Tora, as Thea mentioned there that the Secretary of State conceded on the basis of apparent bias, can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, of course. Well, um, the rule against bias is part of procedural fairness or natural justice, as um, we would term it. And basically the concept that decision making should be fair, decision making by public bodies. Um, the key point is that in order to succeed in a challenge on the basis of bias, one doesn't need to show actual bias, one can show uh, a perception of bias. So one doesn't need to show that the decision was indeed rigged, only that it, it looked that way. The other key point is that it's an objective test, it's not a subjective test. Now, um, I'm sure all of us panellists and no doubt some of those listening will have had um, clients who have been disappointed by the, uh, the system, by a decision, and will have come to the conclusion that because, uh, I don't know, a councillor's cat was once owned by someone who's married to someone who has shares in the development company, uh, the whole thing uh, was a fix happily, just because your client thinks that uh, you're not going to succeed on the basis of bias. Uh, the test is objective and I, I'll, I'll read it now. It comes from a case called Porter and McGill, uh, which was a House of Laws decision from 2002. And it's whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. So, as I say, objective rather than subjective. The other thing the courts have confirmed is that later facts are relevant. So the court isn't just looking at what would have been known to the potential claimant at the time of the decision, but also uh, the factual circumstances afterwards. So something could arise in a document which is disclosed uh, by the decision maker, or indeed the failure to disclose documents may well be relevant uh, to this question. The other concept I think we need to explore when we're looking at bias is the duty of candour. Um, that's something which applies to all public authorities, so it applies to the Secretary of State and it applies to local planning authorities. And that does what it says on the tin. There's a duty to be candid, um, which the courts have described as essentially having your cards up on the table when you're making your decisions. And, and unsurprisingly, uh, the statement of facts and grounds in the Westbury uh, Printworks case relied both on the duty of candour uh, and of course on the, the principle against bias uh, in, in making their claim. Oh, I suppose then, Tori, the question is, is this typical of ministerial decision taking? Um, no, I, I have to say no. Um, there are very few challenges that are brought on the basis of bias and, and very, very few which uh, succeed. And this is indeed captured the headlines for a number of days now and it's notable actually how rare um, this is. That said it's not um, unheard of. Um, there's a case called uh, Broadview Energy Development which I think we'll probably come to later. Uh, anyone who's interested in this topic um, would do well to, to read the judgment of the Court of Appeal in that case. The one thing I would add is, is as a barrister or a lawyer you don't plead bias lightly because it's, quite, it's a serious allegation and one needs to make sure that you have the evidential uh, basis for it. I mean, I have myself pleaded it at least once and that's um, a matter that's ongoing, so I won't, I won't talk about it here. But I would say just because it's a serious allegation, it's one that, that one doesn't plead lightly. Right, thanks, uh, Tora. So, Matthew, we've had the Secretary of State conceded to the decision being quashed. In judicial review, we know that, that no, that's normally the end of the legal proceedings. Is this the end of the matter? Certainly not, Gillian. I mean, we're all used to seeing planning cases um, get in the headlines, become quite controversial, but I think this is really taking things to the next level. I mean, the Secretary of State, Robert Jenrick, was widely regarded as a rising young star in the, in the party. 
Um, and I think it's fair to say that this whole imbroglio has caused him a bit of reputational damage. I mean, whether he'll recover is another matter. Um, but there was at one time talk of a police inquiry, although I understand that's now not being pursued. Um, there have been questions in Parliament, which the Secretary of State sent a junior minister to go and answer instead of himself. The opposition have been asking for the same disclosure of documents that the Secretary of State thought that he'd managed to avoid by consenting to judgment. Do you think then, given the gravity of it, do you think it might lead to a change in the process? I think so. I mean, I, there's a decent chance that it could lead to greater tra transparency in decision making, particularly with regard to, to lobbying. I mean, um, I mean, think of it as akin to a planning committee making declarations about any contact that a decision, the members of the planning committee have with the applicant or third parties. You could have a situation where it's a requirement in a decision letter to disclose lobbying communications which have taken place. I mean, let's not forget that the, the Court of Appeal in a case called Broadview said emphatically that ministers should not be should not be allowing themselves to be lobbied by parties to the planning process if they're making if they're making planning decisions or by local MPs. So I think any internal inquiry which takes place um, to investigate what what on earth actually happened with West Ferry needs to assess whether whether that principle in Broadview was complied with. Right. Um... Well, you mentioned that uh, planning committee. That's a helpful segue. Let's let's look at this question of bias from a completely different context and discuss it in the context of planning committees. We're lucky in that one of the panelists, Ashley, is both a planning barrister and a former councillor. So, actually, the question really for you is: Is there bias among planning committees? And I suppose, putting it another way, how many bribes did you accept as a councillor in order to purchase an Aston Martin? <laughs> uh, well, you're factually, you're right that um, I was a councillor for 11 years and sat as both on a planning committee and um, in a plan making role on the cabinet. Sadly, neither of those contributed to purchasing either of my, my Aston Martins, although they were both very much through the products of the planning system, uh, which um, the fruits of that bore through after I left the authority, I have to say. Um, I think my view on this is that the, the, the dividing line between um, legitimate democratic engagement on the one hand and uh, apparent bias and predetermination uh, on the other is a complicated one. And um, I think that's well illustrated by the Hoven Studios round two decision that was handed down last week by Mr. Justice Dove. And one of the points made there was um, in the correspondence, the planning authority sent to people who'd written into the authority um, about objecting to the application was that advice that they shouldn't contact the members of the council who are serving on the planning committee uh, and members of the planning committee who were contacted um, said we can't take into account what you've got to say you're not supposed to contact us directly uh, and the claimant Hoban Studios uh, brought a claim on a number of grounds one of which was to say well that's um, actually going so far as to be a disproportionate interference with members of the public's Article 10 rights, their right to freedom of expression. And um, Mr Justice Dove ultimately dismissed that claim um, on the basis principally that um, Hoban Studios had the benefit of extremely experienced leading counsel being able to address the committee. But he, he just said two very interesting sentences in the context of dismissing that, which I thought I'd share. He says, first of all, at Paragraph 78, he says it would be extremely difficult to justify as proportionate the discouragement, prohibition or prevention of communication between public and the councillors representing them, which was otherwise in accordance with the law. And then he says, receiving communications from objectors to an application for planning permission is an important feature of freedom of expression in connection with democratic decision taking and in undertaking this aspect of local authority business. So I think this case really illustrates there's two points here. One is that the planning system is ultimately a political system uh, planning judgments are quite often political judgments uh, and secondly that the dividing line between what's appropriate democratic engagement on the one hand with your local constituents and displaying apparent bias and predetermination can actually be quite a fine one and Matthew and Tora's reference to the Broadview case shows that even on national level the courts find that quite difficult to define that distinction to Ros Cranston former politician in the High Court in Broadview saying 
it's just normal part of the democratic process that Andrea Leadsom can go up to the decision-making minister in the tea room and buttonhole him about a, a wind turbine scheme. And that's, that's all to put normal part of the beauty of British democracy. And the Court of Appeal, as Matthew said, was saying, that's absolutely inappropriate. This is a, a, effectively a, a formal administrative decision. It's not judicial, but I mean, it's a formal administrative decision where decision takers should just not be having contact with um, the parties outside the formal inquiry process. So uh, difficult and challenging, I think, um, is what I'd say. But to answer your question, no, I, I don't think um, any evidence of local authorities being actually biased or apparently biased. I think they are, generally speaking, um, well-meaning people trying to do their best in difficult circumstances with limited resources. Ashley, it was a noted absence in your answer that you didn't expressly deny bribes, but we'll, we'll overlook that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what, what, if any, implications do you think this judgment has going forward? Uh, well, Hoban Studios, um, yeah. well, I, I think um, it, it's it, basically it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it very difficult for authorities to say um, exactly what the dividing line is. And what Hoban Studios tells you is it's not a simple answer to just say, please don't contact the decision makers. That's, that is um, likely to be uh, a breach of uh, members of the public's Article 10 rights of expression to express their view to the, um, the decision maker directly. Um, and remember, only saved in this case, the case didn't go down on that point, because um, there was direct participation at the planning committee meeting by the representative. And by no means is that the case with every planning application. Um, uh, objectors often don't have the entitlement to speak uh, at every planning committee item. Uh, and so it, it could be quite difficult for authorities to say you cannot contact decision makers. I think what it shows is you've got to have an open handed way of dealing with it, as Matthew says. You've got to allow people to contact the decision maker, but then the other side of the coin is the decision maker's got to be open about the fact that they've been contacted and disclosed that in the appropriate forum, probably at the planning committee meeting itself. Right. So I suppose you've mentioned planning committees as being this political forum. Let's talk um, about planning appeals. This is the fear, if, if, if you could pick this up. We know that a planning committee refuse, if they refuse planning commission, whether they're owing to bias or otherwise, there's the remedy of pursuing an appeal to the Secretary of State. Is our planning appeals rigged in your opinion? Well, in some respects, the question is too hard edged because what do we mean by rigged? There's bad rigging, bias, um, but there's also legitimate rigging, for example, policy mechanisms designed to bring about a particular result or, or in particular favour of, of certain types of development. Now, there are obviously a good deal of inspectors out there doing a brilliant job, all of those who have tuned in today, for example. Um, but I think it would be disingenuous of me to say that the planning appeal system works perfectly. I say that for a number of reasons, but I'll give you three. The first is there has always been a better chance for an appellant of securing permission following an inquiry rather than hearings or written representations. And that suggests to me that not all modes of appeal are equally good for all parties. Secondly, there are obviously some inspectors who are more pro-development than others, and we know the statistics show that. And Killian, I'm sure like me, when you're approaching an inquiry or a hearing, you check to see who your inspector is, and you'll know whether or not it's a good draw for your client. Um, and very often, or not very often, but occasionally I've had clients withdraw from an appeal because they don't like the inspector that they've been landed with, and they think that it's going to be more difficult to get a permission with that inspector than would otherwise be the case. But finally, there are other anomalies in decision making, um, and, and particularly, I think, around the application of planning policy. Um, for example, I'm thinking of the um, application of policy relating to local housing need, uh, see central Bedfordshire, and also the application of the tilted balance. And more often than not, I think those anomalies come down in favour of local planning authorities. So on that last point, I'm junior to Richard Kimblin QC in the Gladman case that was heard before Mr Justice Holgate um, earlier this year, and that concerns the correct interpretation of paragraph 11D2 of the framework and the tilted balance. Now the background to that case was that in 2019, between January and September, there were 67 appeal decisions relating to major housing development in which the tilted balance was engaged. Of those decisions, 13 were allowed, 17%, and the remaining 54 were dismissed. And in September, if you were an appellant, you were really unlucky because all of those major housing appeals, which engaged the tilted balance, were dismissed. 
Now, in some respects, the tilted balance is a way of legitimately rigging the planning system in favour of granting planning permission for schemes where the tilted balance is engaged. But in 2019, at least, you had a greater chance of securing planning permission for a scheme that didn't engage the tilted balance than one that did. And I think that needs some explanation and perhaps greater quality control, because on face value, that result just doesn't make a lot of sense. And a lot of land promoters and developers are withdrawing from appeals um, and stepping back from the appeal process as a means of securing planning permission for that reason. So finally, I'm going to just make listeners aware that we have been granted uh, permission by Lord Justice Lewison uh, to take um, the case on the interpretation of paragraph 11d2 to the Court of Appeal. So hopefully in due course, we'll have some further scrutiny of that particular part of the framework. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, those statistics are obviously really interesting because... I mean, I certainly have seen that the pendulum has swung against the development industry in the last year or so with the application of the tilted balance and developers saying, well, we, we get the tilted balance, but how tilted actually is it? Do you think we're likely to see a change in the presumption in favour of sustainable development fear? Well, I think something's got to change, Killian, for, for, for exactly the reason you identify that the pendulum has swung against the development industry. Um, and, and we've we've kind of all seen that. It's not a secret. Everyone knows about it, but it's finding out what the solution to that is. So I think that there has to be a change. And also, of course, now we've got coronavirus um, and we know that's going to have an enormous impact um, on the development industry. So I think either which way we're going to see policy development um, in order to ensure that new development comes forward because we know how that stimulates economic recovery and so it's necessary. Now I could controversially suggest that the tilted balance could apply to all new housing development uh, coming forward but I don't think that the policy would go that far um, but goodness me reading the policy exchange essays that were published last week anything uh, is up for grabs and I think that might well be the topic of our next webinar. Yes yes absolutely um, right well let, I suppose let's try and draw these various threads together and can sort of get a concluded view from the panelists so Tora do you want to go first uh, generally is the planning system rigged? Um, thanks, Killian. Obviously, it's a very hard-edged question. I, I would come down on, in favour of no. Um, look, no system is going to be perfect. Um, it's set up and it's run by humans. Now, um, obviously, present company accepted. I've never met one of us who's perfect. And, and people are going to make mistakes. Uh, and that includes planning decision makers uh, and potentially even barristers sometimes. Um, but for me, the key issue is have you got the checks and balances in place to ensure that decisions are taken lawfully? And for me, we do. Uh, that's provided through judicial review and statutory challenge. And that's an opportunity for claimants to present their, the unvarnished facts uh, to an impartial judge and to get a decision on the lawfulness uh, of, of what's taken place. So. Um, and, I, and I really think we shouldn't take that for granted because obviously there are some countries where you wouldn't dream of taking your government to court. And, and if you did, then there may, there may um, be very real repercussions for you. So let's not take that for granted. And, and I would say broadly, no, the checks and balances are there. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So, um, Matthew, do you want to answer the question? Is the planning system rigged? Whenever I hear someone say the system is rigged, um, my immediate reaction tends to be, you must have lost out somehow. And I think, you know, when you think about Donald Trump repeatedly tweeting that the 2016 presidential election was rigged until he won, it, um, do I think the planning system is rigged? Well, I think there might be individual decisions where something goes awry. Um, and West Ferry is potentially one of them, who knows? Um, that was taken with the appearance of bias, but is the system rigged? Absolutely not. I, I think the system at the end of the day is governed by section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act, um, which requires planning decisions to be taken in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. We know from a long line of cases, most recently Wright in the Supreme Court, that material considerations are restricted. So you can't buy or sell a planning permission there, and that's absolutely as it should be. So no, I don't think the system's rigged. Uh, Ashley, what's your view? Um, well, I'll be uh, controversial and say it, it's rigged in this sense, that um, planning is a set of economic, social, environmental competing interests that have to be resolved in one way or another. 
And um, the striking of that balance in our system is done at a local level through a development plan. And then the system, as Matthew says, uh, pr presents a legal priority in favour of the development plan. Obviously, it can be departed from in certain situations for material considerations, but it, it rigs effectively the system, the decision making part of the system, in favour of those locally struck economic, social, environmental competing interests that have been determined. Um, is that a bad thing? No, I don't think it is. I think in a democratic society, um, decisions like this are complex. There's not a single correct answer as to where. Um, industrial growth, housing growth, um, major infrastructure projects should go. I think it's right that those decisions are taken openly, transparently within the law, but ultimately the people who take those are then democratically accountable at a local or national election. So yeah, I think it's rigged in that narrow sense. Um, and Thea, uh, finally for you, do you think the system's rigged? Yeah, well, I think that the discussion we've just had shows really the uh, the interest, I suppose, of having four different lawyers answer the same question um, in, you know, well, three completely different ways so far. And I'm going to go for it for a different way as well, um, because um, I, I agree the starting point is, well, what do you mean by, by rigged? Are you talking about something that's fraudulent or are you talking about something that is designed in a specific way, um, having regard to specific legitimate factors? Now, I don't think the planning system as a whole is illegitimately rigged but it does seem obvious to me that when policy is introduced to encourage more development uh, the tendency by decision takers is to think that the system is rigged too far in favour of new development and to water down uh, that policy support defeating the object of the policy in the first place um, so um, rigged might be putting it too far but clearly issues that need to be resolved would be my response perhaps diplomatically <laughs> right, well, thank you very much, everyone. So um, at the beginning, um, someone's messaged me privately asking whether Thea is surrounded by Jen <laughs> and they missed the opening. So <laughs> Thea, I don't know whether you want to provide an explanation or just leave that in the air. I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, <laughs> right. Well, I won't leave you alone in that sense. Um, right, <laughs> at the beginning, folks, we took a poll at the beginning, taking everyone's view on whether the system is rigged. It's only right that we, um, we redo the poll. Um, and see if everyone wants to vote again, having heard what the panellists say. So is the planning system rigged? Again, all the answers are anonymous. They won't be shared outside of this. I've seen a few people say that they were unable to see the polls. Sorry about that. The polls rigged. Sounds dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dodgy poll. <laughs> I'll admit to that. <laughs> and, and, and while we're doing it, thank you so much for all the absolutely fantastic questions that have come in. And I'm, I'm kind of gutted that we don't have an hour long episode to just respond because there's some really good uh, points for discussion there. But if we can't pick them up now, I guess we, we pick them up in a different episode. Mm. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll end the, uh, the poll there, just conscious of time. Thank you for everyone who's voted. We've got 80% of people voted. And you can see there that the poll largely resembles, uh, <laughs> well, well, I suppose the amount of people who can't decide has been reduced significantly. So yeah, we've swayed people one way or another. Um, and most people are a little bit or mostly not. And very few are saying it's either absolutely is or absolutely isn't. Um, right. Well, thank you uh, so much, everyone, for joining us. From on behalf of myself and all the panellists, it's, it's really, um, really enjoy this. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this is the first in a series of five webinars that we'll be conducting every Tuesday at quarter past five for the next five weeks. You can use the same Zoom login details that you use today to log in each and every week. And next week's episode will be hosted by Thea, uh, who will be addressing whether the planning system is ripe for reform. Um, we're, we're, we've gone way over the time that we said, but let's just take one or two questions. So Matthew, I think, do you want to take one of the questions from Jim? There. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a really good question here, which is, it, the question is, it sounds as if the Secretary of State had acknowledged that the timing of the decision was influenced by the adoption of the civil schedule. So that's the West Ferry decision we're talking about. And was this not actual bias? Um, and I think the answer to that is that the Secretary of State hasn't acknowledged that the timing was influenced by the, the timing of the adoption of the civil schedule. All they've acknowledged is that the fact of the timing looks looks or gives off the impression of bias so they've not gone any further than that in terms of conceding the claim and that's that's as far as they had to take it in order to establish that there was an unlawfulness and finally again there's lots of questions and we'll be happy to answer some of these offline so you can obviously contact us but actually if you want to answer the question perhaps about the distinction between 
large and small applications and transparency? Yeah, very happy to do that. And thank you, Andrew, for that question. I think you're right in the sense there is a, a, a difference between people's perception about how open the system is between a small, very simple scheme and a very large, complex one where there's lots of issues at play. I think the real issue there, however, is more about people feeling empowered to take part in the system. If you've got a very large scheme with lots of complicated issues, lots of technical evidence, sometimes being able to assimilate that and making the points you want to make in an effective way um, it is difficult and complex. And um, that's why perhaps the perception is that um, those things are um, less easy and less transparent to, to, to make a, a say on. I mean, the solution to that, of course, is to instruct um, one of the many, many um, able planning barristers available on the call who would help you deconstruct all the material <laughs> and make, make your participation uh, and your voice count. Right. Well, I think we'll probably have to leave it there, given the time. But um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us um, again on behalf of myself and all the panellists. And we hope to see you all next week on Tuesday. So thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.